So I have something exceptional I want to share with you here. This is a memorial painting, 24 by 36, uh, commissioned by my friend Chris Campbell for his wife Brenda as a living memorial to his father-in-law, Frank M. Lobbesser. Um They called him Poncho. And I was just going to show a uh, time-lapse, although this is the longest time-lapse painting I've ever done. Uh, and it's too special to just put into a little category and show it. And we were going to release the video sooner, but, you know, the New Year's and Christmas and whatnot. So it seemed like appropriate now to go over this and talk about the life of this amazing human being. As was told to me through the stories from his loved ones. This was, uh, this was quite an endeavor, and we will get into all of this. Uh, Brenda, Frank's daughter, one of his daughters, uh, had no idea that she was about to walk in and see this piece. And I don't actually think Chris knew exactly what he was walking into. I think he was just going to see a painting or something. So this is something more. a small little arc. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if I had known I had done it that bad, I'd be crying over it. <laughs> intense and so I don't really have the interest in making a spectacle of Brenda's emotions uh, her and Chris are wonderful human beings they are kind and generous and caring in ways that I can't possibly explain to you so I'm going to talk a little bit about this piece and uh, I'm going to walk you through it right here I am putting together the underpainting uh, the idea is, of course, to create a tonal system of value upon which we build the painting. And this painting required quite a bit of time because there are so many elements and the visual effect uh, of having fields of view where you can walk into, that they also bring you into the room and bring you into the field. Right there behind me, you can see the green leaves on the trees. We just saw this. This painting took months, and it was worth it. It was uh, a challenge. So Frank was into tractors, and I have the joy of knowing some of the people that knew him that are outside of his family that were into tractors and tractor pulls. But Frank collected uh, John Deere tractors, he loved a John Deere tractor, especially this Model B from the, uh, I believe it's from the 50s. It has a very distinct sound. So we had to pick one tractor, and this seemed like the go-to out of all of them. It's a hard thing to do to pick a favorite when somebody loves something so much, but this seemed appropriate. So we're laying in the underpainting the background we're starting to put color into the sunny side up sun and uh, working around the edges here one of the things that I really felt was very important was to represent every aspect of the life as it was told to me by others as best I could and a life doesn't fit into one image a life fits into a life there's far too much information for a poem or a painting 
these things fall horrifically short of the goodness and kindness and caring that make up a human life, especially a father, a grandfather. And from everything that I was told, Poncho was what I think of when I think of farmers. A human being that didn't rest until others were cared for. A human being who put every other component of life ahead of themselves. Every other human being ahead of themselves. A true caretaker of their family. A cornerstone or rock upon which to build the foundation of future generations. And Poncho was all of these things. It's really hard for me to condense that into a painting. So there were a lot of elements that had to go into this. You're illustrating ideas about a human life. It's not a simple or easy thing, and it shouldn't be. It's going to echo, and you're putting upon the surface a story, an idea, that generations, you know, yet in the womb of time, will have to extrapolate from to understand a component of one of their ancestors. So really, there is no greater honor than to be asked to do something like this. And with any luck, it will carry forward and the creator will fade into the background and the painting will live on its own merits. And that's what's really important here. I decided that the first idea that popped into my head was the spilt milk. I grew up around farmers. I have been around them all my life and my father's side of my family was very much uh, engaged in agriculture and farming. And there really is no use crying over spilt milk. Farmers routinely have to suffer through disappointment and hardship and put a smile on their face and put their back into their work and lubricate the gears and the machinery with their own tears, blood, and sweat to make things happen. And they have to do it with grace, is really what it is. So, no use crying over spilt milk. And I think that I had to sneak that in there. It seemed important somehow. I can often think of farms and being around farmers and looking at the floors of barns and their weathered appearance and how many days freezing cold, sweating in the heat, working endlessly, watching your sweat and tears fall into those boards, and I felt it was necessary to have them there. Wherever I see really good agricultural practices, now where I live, and driving out in 2000 to study with Greg Judy, and driving down to Swoop, Virginia for Joel Salatin's courses, and being part of, you know, all these events, I notice that whenever I'm in agricultural areas, there is this element of beautiful clouds that permeate everything, and that's a result of the grasses uh, evaporating moisture into the atmosphere. If you look at the work of Alan Savory, you can see this, and he worked with animals, uh, ruminants, to repair the grasslands of Africa, and... Uh, so I think about that, and I felt like a, an abundance of cloud cover would be important, but also blue skies. The edge of Frank's table makes up the edge of a water system that nourished the cows, and of course, there are elements that are very personal, like his chair. There were many versions of it. This was just the most recent, I believe. And we keep stopping to show the progress of the piece, so you get an idea of the direction we are going. The Gersey cows that are in the foreground, uh, the type of dairy cattle. Frank worked with all types of animals. He worked with cattle and pigs and sheep, you name it. A true farmer, true to every component of being a farmer. And he loved what he did. 
It's actually kind of funny, one of the many stories that Chris tells me, and uh, I hope he'll forgive me for sharing this, but I always think it's kind of funny, is that one day they were castrating young uh, pigs, and Poncho brought Chris out back, and I believe this is right around the time that he had proposed to Brenda. And Poncho put his arm around Chris rather snugly and looked at the pigs and kind of made a suggestion or made a statement along the lines of that, like, see how that works? <laughs> it's one of those nuances we have in New England, especially among farmers, where they sometimes say crass or uh, abrasive things because they're telling you the truth. And the truth is often crass or abrasive. The truth is hard. Uh, and it, it's not for those of lesser character. Luckily, Chris is a person of amazing character, so he weathered that little suggestion that maybe this could happen to you uh, with grace. And uh, I always thought that that story was fun. I wanted Poncho to be in multiple places, so an almost apparition-like element of him above his chair in the kitchen seemed very, very important. Because from many angles, he was always on a tractor, he was always working, he never stopped. And yet, at certain points, he did get to sit and rest and enjoy life. But as with any farmer, it's just a pause in between the next day's workload to be greeted with strength and to push forward. It's a sort of endearing spirit that inspires me. When I put the painting up and while I was making the painting, all I could think of was Paul Harvey's uh, speech, I think it's the 70s or 80s, that was information gathered from Appalachian Mountain folk and farmers about the ideas of what a farmer is, and he talks about how God made a farmer. I love that speech by Paul Harvey. I didn't include it here, but you could look it up. And they basically talk about the hardship, how the farmer could, uh, God needed a farmer, God needed a caretaker. Uh, you don't have to be spiritual necessarily, although for me, being in touch with nature and agriculture is a deeply spiritual thing. But it talks about this strength to, you know, watch animals die and fail, to break yourself only to find out you can't even make ends meet, to stop your workload in the middle of the day, to sprint the, to, I'm sorry, to splint the uh, broken leg of a meadow lark. That type of gentle, strong, you know, ceaseless energy that requires of self a self-sacrifice that defies most people's understanding is the backbone of what a farmer is. And listening to the stories about Poncho from his loved ones, it painted a scene in my mind I have seen many times where someone who is so good doesn't even stop for accolades. They just know what must be done, and so they will do it. And then it seems like the rest of us sometimes simply bask in the glory of existing, not even thinking about the many important things that make up the dedication to that life. I often tell people that I don't really care what people who play sports ball do. My heroes are people who run into burning buildings to save children, who brave the possibility of their own death to protect the innocent, those who work merciless long hours caring for the sick and healing people. But the one group that almost never gets talked about is the group that keeps all of these people going, that work like dogs and are usually thought of less than by 
simple city dwellers who think they know everything because they've taken a few courses or they've heard some deep philosophical bullshit. The people who break the land and sew it back together, who work with nature and pull forth from its bounty a yield to sustain all of us. When I lived on the North Shore of Massachusetts, I used to go into a local farm up there, and there was a sign on the wall that said, you might need a doctor once in a while. Once in your life, you might even need a lawyer, but you need a farmer three times a day. It really drives home to me the importance of what it means to be in that position, what it means to do that work. And while I engage in regenerative agriculture myself, if it wasn't for people who have paved the way before me, I wouldn't have had food to even go on those endeavors. And it's people like Frank, it's people like Poncho who paved the way, who listened to a million ridiculous ideas and then went right back to work to raise the food, to pull it from the earth, to make sure that we all had the energy to do the things that we wanted to do. Somebody who just gave of themselves. It's beyond my understanding to actually explain it if someone's never done it. My wife and I, we do agriculture. We work with people and teach regenerative agriculture and permaculture systems. And it's always an interesting conversation when they realize how much work is involved and yet also how much joy is there. I think there's something inherently human that we're missing because we're not engaged in that conversation. Poncho spent his entire life in that conversation. There's something about a spirit of a human being. It's like a tractor. And Poncho, I feel like, was like a tractor. It doesn't go 190 miles an hour, and it's not flashy necessarily, unless you know what looks good when it comes to tractors, and he certainly did. It's tireless, unstoppable, steady, and strong. That's what I heard from Chris and Brenda. That's what I heard from all of the family that spoke to me. And it is what a farmer is. It's the ceaseless work and love of it. And Frank never stopped, and he never stopped loving this. It's truly inspiring to me. Here we are painting the colors of the John Deere tractor. It is one of the most classic tractors. Anybody who sees one of these knows exactly what it is. I must confess, I don't know much about tractors, but I can look at something that made people happy and brought them joy and listen to why and try to understand it. And so while I work in agriculture part-time, I don't work with machinery. So I have to sit back and listen to others talk about it, and I think of my cousins and family that have passed and how much joy when they talk about certain pieces of machinery and certain activities when it comes to agriculture. And I know it makes me smile. So I try to put that type of joy into this machinery here that all of his children and grandchildren talked about him taking them for rides on the tractor and doing tractor pulls and just is just fantastic when I shared the sound of the tractor I had to look up different tractors and I was trying to get the right angle on them and I sent uh, the sound of one of the tractors that I thought was correct to Chris and Chris said no that's exactly what it sounds like that's it for those of you who don't know different machinery does sound different and this specific tractor has a very unique sound if you listen to them long enough you hear it and that was kind of a joy considering I don't work with those things as much and I've kind of always had a love for looking at them I just don't understand them so but I I think I can paint one so we'll go with that 
here I am doing layers of color over the underpainting. And you're bu building and building layers of color. And as you add layers, the semi-opacity of the paint absorbs light. It hits all the different color layers and then bounces back to the viewer. And it's even more of a challenge when it comes to things like tractors because you want the right green and you want it to feel right. And if you've ever stood looking at a John Deere tractor, it is a very specific green. It does things in the light. It really is special. Maybe I'm romanticizing something, but I just don't care. It is cool. And it was fun to paint it. I will say that painting mechanical things is quite a challenge. If you've never painted straight lines or perfect circles, it's very different than painting just a landscape. And one of the things I actually enjoyed about this painting the most is that it's a landscape. It's a portrait. It's multiple portraits. And it has, I'm going to mispronounce this, but trompe l'oeil is a uh, French technique that means trick of the eye. So while you see all of the elements individual, Frank and his tractor not only appear small and distant, but giant and massive over everything. I feel like that was appropriate because you must have an imposing stature as a human being, not necessarily in height, but in grandeur of who you are, to command this much love and respect from so many people. And so while Poncho was absorbed in his agriculture, he was absorbed in farming, he was not above it, he was immersed in it. Nothing was above him. Everything involved care and careful craftsmanship and understanding and maybe just gentle nudging sometimes maybe things had to be moved or pushed but it, the way a farmer does it especially someone like Poncho that's an art form and it's hard to understand from the outside because maybe you've never done it but when someone like this does it it's watching a conductor and an orchestra you are seeing something done, even if it doesn't make sense, in, in strength and grace, and it produces what it's supposed to. And it's done so well, and this is often the case with the arts. It is definitely the case with food or medical science or, you know, p pick a variety of subjects, that when it's done really well, it looks effortless. And nothing could be further from the truth. But... It does appear effortless, and that's, that's what we're trying to get across here, is that it's a lot. It's a lot of work, you know, but it's effortless in how it looks because of the life that was poured into the process. One of the things that I wanted to represent in the painting was the connection with animals, agriculture, the land, and food that is on our table because it was important to Poncho that people eat and eat well. So he took care of everyone. He cooked. He watched over people. He would feed you and care for you. And he only sat to rest when his work was done. And what's on your plate is not just a thing. It's life. And life gives life. I don't like reducing things to just a it's a pork chop, it's a piece of lettuce, it's a piece of kale, it's a fried egg. Uh, there is so much work and life and blood and sweat that goes into the act of making food that I think if it makes us uncomfortable to look at it, then we are failing something in ourselves that is humanity. And that is a sickness that I don't understand. It is completely okay to understand and to sit in awe of those elements when it comes to the connection of our food system. It's normal. It's natural. It's part of the cycle of life. And so I felt it's so inherently appropriate to put it in here. As a side note, a lot of this painting 
when what I included in it was based on inspiration. I wasn't dictated the format at all, which is always the best thing for an artist is not to hold them down and tell them what to do, but to let them run with what information you give them. And apparently one of Frank's favorite foods on earth was ham. So when I had given the painting to Brenda and Chris and they had gone home, Chris reached out and contacted me and asked why I put ham on the plate with the chickens. And I originally had meant to put like kale or tomatoes and I just kept going back to ham. So I put ham. If I feed ham to my chickens, they're very excited about it. And that's when Chris laughed and he said it was Poncho's favorite thing to eat was ham. So I'm I'm not against that. I, I certainly enjoy raising pigs. I work with pigs and I also like eating them. So, you know, that's <laughs> that's the way it is. But I don't want to disconnect them from what they are. And uh, as Joel Salatin says, one of the best things about pigs is the pigness of pigs. So we raise our pigs out in pasture in the woods and we let them dig around and enjoy being pigs and... When the time comes, they have one bad day, and that's the way it should be, in my opinion. So here I am layering in forage underneath cattle. Uh, if you know Greg Judy or uh, Ian Michael Innes or Alan Savory, who is really the father of all of that, uh, you understand the importance of forage and ruminants and the impact and how soil grows. So I, I was really overjoyed to put all these different types of forage in here, and clovers and grasses and when we went to the first, I think, in 15-year Stockman Grass Farmers Conference in 2021, I was lucky enough to sit next to Greg and Jan Judy and uh, listen to some wonderful people talk about the growth of forage. And uh, I don't know all of it. I just know what is be preferable when it comes to feeding animals. And to see people like Greg Judy light up and talk about this, I can only imagine that if I got a chance to talk to Poncho about it, that he would have some very strong and wonderful opinions on all the different types of plants and forage that different animals would enjoy. And I get to watch that myself from time to time. It really makes me smile. So we're doing detail here. This is uh, I'm using a technique where I brace my fingers with my other fingers on parts of the canvas that are dry. Uh, my cousin Chris uh, likes to do pinstriping, and that's a quite a trick. And I watched a lot of pinstripers. It's not a technique. Uh, that hand technique is used by most fine artists, but I watched a lot of pinstripers, and as a tattoo artist, I feel like that would suit well. And it, it, that control mechanism for holding the hand was, was, really, was really beneficial. So that was good. We're going in and putting some of the detail in the, uh, in the cattle. And cows are fun, weird animals. They are just very interesting animals. They respond to certain stimuli in strange ways. They also have a, if you ever look this up online, it's kind of fun. They have a habit of getting their heads stuck in all sorts of weird objects. So when you have cattle or ruminants, you have to be kind of careful of those things because they will get their heads wedged into all sorts of weird stuff. And... Just because it struck them at the moment, they will also go right through a fence or jump things to go eat grass that is fairly identical from what I can tell from all the other grass, but, you know, the spirit moves them, so off they go. And that, I think, sometimes for people when they're first getting into this is maddening. I bet Poncho would have taken that all in stride. I keep showing sections of the painting in its progression because I want you to see how it manifests into the finished product. I think that's kind of fun. It's a lot of layering of paint, but uh, if this is something that you're inspired to do, please do it, because it is so worth it. Pick up the book, Drawing from the Right Side of the Brain, and start following those things, and you can do this. I swear you can. We're coming up on the finished piece here, and all the fine points are done, and we get to see Poncho forever. And I'm so happy with how this turned out. So... There's the memorial to Poncho. And uh, a quote from the Paul Harvey reading occurs at the bottom. But I really, I would encourage you to go look that up. Uh, you can see it on YouTube. Uh, look up So God Made a Farmer. And uh, a deep and profound thank you to uh, Chris and Gracie for helping 
keep make this happen for Brenda and for future generations. You guys are amazing human beings, and I am deeply uh, happy that I get to think of you as friends and as family. So there it is in its uh, in all its glory, and we are going to be doing Prince's Dress. I see his truck. I know it's his truck, and then the chair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm standing at the table. <laughs> <laughs> like these yeah because it's just stuff that he yeah clean out his pockets and hang everything up like the sets and mm. sets of keys uh, and yeah. any other random like <laughs> yeah. so like he just keep adding nails to the frame of the window <laughs> to be able to hang all I can respect things that. <laughs> I certainly can respect yeah, that because he had his spot of the table yeah yeah and this is this is like the counter, the kitchen counter behind his seat, because his seat's in the corner. Yeah. yeah. You know? I'm trying to sneak the seat in there in such a way. Yep. Like, oh, no, that's awesome. <laughs> You'll have to forgive me. The one pun is the sunny side up egg. <laughs> <laughs> Only one person I've, I've, I've <laughs> shared it with a few friends, and somebody said, "Is that a sunny side up sun?" I said, "Yes." Really? Wow. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. It's beautiful. Oh, that's what we're going. <laughs> If you would like to purchase a print of this piece, we are doing a limited edition run of 50 hand signed, and we are going to take 50% of all of the profits and donate them to a cause to help keep farmers on their land and teach regenerative agriculture. Thank you for looking.